Hello and welcome to Securities Lending Sunday today. I'm always a rant, so I'm your host. Normally we do this show on a Saturday, but yesterday we were just fraught with technical problems. I'm hoping that that's not the case today. Uh, everything looks good to me on all the indicators and everything, so we're going to power through this today. The difference is today we're both live on LinkedIn and YouTube, so rather than My name is Roy Zimmerhand, I'm a principal with, I'm your host today. I do this every Saturday live on LinkedIn, and then, as I said, the videos are available on Sundays on this channel. I'm uh, going to talk about a panel that I moderated uh, this past Thursday for the Securities Finance Technology Symposium 2022, uh, also by the people in Securities Finance Times, with a raft of sponsors there who help bring it to everyone free. Now look, I'm going to put a link to the event in the show notes afterwards. Uh, so maybe you can actually access it for free. Uh, if you can't do that, what I'm going to do today is just give you a summary of my own panel today. And then next week, in the weekly video, I will talk about the other uh, panel sessions. So I was hoping to do uh, more of the uh, general overview in this session, but uh, there were some technical problems at the, um, at the host. So it's not just me, other people have challenges from time to time as well, so I don't have time to do that. So today we're going to talk about the session I was, uh, I was running. As you know, what I do with these sessions is I always have a, uh, another um, uh, video clip, I have another screen, I have a show notes, so I have uh, various PowerPoints that I, that I do along the way. Let me just uh, bring that up now. Uh, one sec. My screens need to get in line. And there we go. So here you go. Here's the first slide. Uh, as I said, the topic was liquidity and trading. It was the Securities Finance Tech Symposium. As I said, uh, you know, the trading and technology session is to me the most important part of any of these conferences because the truth is securities finance exists to support trading uh, for market makers, so people that keep the day-to-day -day liquidity going on the exchanges, but through to institutional investors that might be hedging parts of their portfolios, through to the short sellers that are either engaging in arbitrage or directional trading strategies Increasingly, those of you who follow me you know that I also talk a lot about retail access to this market for both the lending side and the short selling side. So really, I think trading with liquidity is at the heart of the business and it applies to everything. So not just the trading side, the liquidity part also covers off the collateral side of things where banks and securities firms are trying to get collateral in order to satisfy their various derivative obligations and other bilateral exposures. And not just into the securities firms, but now with a lot of the regulations that have come in in the last sort of 10 years, there's a wide need for a huge variety of participants in the derivatives markets to either give or receive collateral, and securities lending is a key part of it. So I was pretty fortunate in this session because uh, I was able to have a really strong panel, which I'll moment. Uh, as I said, this, these are the topics that we've talked about in the previous 46 weeks of doing this. And next week I'll be doing part two of the wider set of uh, sessions that I'll be covering on. Depending on how the timing goes, there might be a third session, so I might break up the other panels into two different sessions. We'll have to wait and see how it goes. Um, so I hope you're enjoying your Sunday. If I wasn't here, I did tell you that we're actually watching live. We want to put this up for those of you that are actually watching on replay. I would be back out in the sunshine, enjoying an absolutely fantastic Sunday. And I hope, in fact, that you're all watching this on replay and you're enjoying your Sunday as it is now, watching it at a more convenient time for you. Uh, but I'm here live, and so this is what we're going to be talking about. 
really four key questions which I've extracted. Now, the session itself ran for an hour. Um, today, obviously, these are going to run for an hour. Uh, I'm going to talk about the sort of feedback and input from the panelists on these four questions and kind of give you my overview. Uh, we're talking about the lines blurring between securities lending, repo, and synthetics. We're talking about lowering the overall cost of trading. Trying to identify where gains to trading and liquidity efficiency uh, will be coming from, and just have a general discussion about moving away from spreadsheets and telephones. Those were really the key things we'll talk about more than that. So, again, we'll open the link in the show notes. Hopefully, you'll be able to access the event even though it has finished. Uh, these were my panelists. I'm really excited about this. Shane Martin, uh, someone who I've worked with in the past. Very takes across a whole range of activities in the business. Uh, now, currently in WeMatch. Uh, Mike Norwood, again, who uh, is now in Hyperland, uh, best voice for these events. Uh, come across so that the whole Hyperland thing doesn't work out. He's got an opportunity, I think, in uh, podcasting. Um, Ed Tyndall Bisco, who I didn't really know before this session, uh, from IR, making market leaders in you know, some of the technology spaces for a very long time. Travis Keller, another a new contact of mine, but uh, really impressed with uh, some of the conversations that we've had, and uh, we'll be following that up. He's from State Street, so fantastic panel, uh, and he's going to show themselves around, so I hope you get a chance to see the live event. As always, I do these uh, videos to uh, share information, to help people learn more about the business that I've come to love so much uh, over time. And uh, I can't get enough of them. And so if this helps you understand it a little bit more, uh, give me a thumbs up. I uh, appreciate that so I can see which videos actually work for you guys and which ones uh, are of less interest. Uh, of course, if you want to be advised of subsequent videos, uh, you can subscribe. And if you ring the little bell here, uh, you also be told that every time there's a new video that I Right, so let's go to number one. Are the lines blurring between securities lending, repo, and synthetics? So the reason that I think this is a particularly important question is one thing that I've seen is how this industry is very much gone from uh, silo-based transaction activities into more of a customer-focused experience. I'll tell you what I mean by that. Uh, by silo-based, I mean you used to have a securities lending business, have a repo business and then there'd be a synthetic business, and each of them was separate and distinct. So, if a hedge fund wanted to come in and do a physical short, they'd have to talk to one, one uh, customer service person. If they wanted to do a repo financing transaction, they'd speak to another person. And if they wanted to take a short or long position and they wanted to do it through a synthetic, so through a swap, for example. Instead of doing it in the cash market, they'd have to talk to the third person. Well, really, about, uh, I guess, 20 years ago now, uh, Hedge Fund said, we don't really want to be doing that. What we want to do is we want to talk to one person at our service provider, and you guys sort of you know, sort it out internally. But why, why should we have to learn how to navigate your organization? And I think to a greater and lesser extent, firms started moving uh, to that uh, kind of a model where there would be one service rep. More so for the cash and synthetics as well, and less about integrated repo. But I think over time, you know, that has progressed over, uh, over, overall. So it's it's kind of moving along that line. But organizationally, the service providers themselves, I think, increasingly saw that there was a lot of commonality between these businesses. So even in their internal structures, started changing their focus and direction and their hierarchies, uh, their technology needs, um, and their, uh, and their own with their customers. So I think it's kind of on both sides. Some of the comments uh, from uh, the analysts were really, they were focused on, first of all, you know, I think uh, each of these people is, was very passionate about the topics, and I just pulled up a couple of bullet points from, from each of them. So Shane really talked about uh, the efficiency and profitability for firms uh, driving a big part of this kind of internal convergence where they brought everything together, kind of reorganized structure of their workflow. 
purposes, but also be driven by the regulatory needs, right? So there's no question, uh, and we've talked about this in our, uh, our video on synthetics, which I'll also put a link into the, in, into the show. Um, the reality is the regulatory structure um, and capitalization features are synthetics over cash market transactions. So, so for a prime broker or a bank or a securities firm that's actually providing a, a, a service to someone, the reality is given an option, they will always try to structure it as a synthetic because it gives them all kinds of regulatory advantages over we'll doing the same transaction in the cash market. So that was very much what Shane's uh, comments were around is there's huge, huge efficiency gains, uh, there's huge profitability impact depending on how you actually structure it, and it kind of forced firms to rethink how they did things. Um, Ed was talking about sort of the te technological capability, right? Because in the past, these things have always been limited by the technology service providers, what each of the platforms can do. And I think, again, uh, not only have the existing service providers often added other capabilities to their core products, but also uh, brought um, additional uh, integrated products as part of it. So they actually expand the functionality of these programs, but also making them available more easily to investors and market participants. They can actually bring technology in, and it isn't as much of a huge overhaul to expand and integrate functionality. Of course, all of this will be dependent on commonality between the trading structures, uh, the way trades are booked, the way that they're handled, the way that interest is calculated, the way that uh, opening and closing and that clauses are actually treated, the way that netting is set up works. All of those things need to be put in place to really make the most of technology. And in fact, the trade associations have been working very diligently over recent years to try and bring some more of that commonality in terms of uh, the documentation process, really as a, uh, as a precursor to um, digi digitization and really enabling our digitization process to get uh, Mike uh, from Equiland is talking so where, again, a bank has, has an option to do things one way or another, they now have really the obligation, but also the incentive to uh, look at all of their transactions and allocate and reallocate trades to the right structures, to the right counter companies at the right time. So it's very much a game of, of optimization, aligning trades, realigning trades, rebooking, changing, refinancing, different structures and there's no reason why if you put trade out of one structure and something else is more attractive financially there's no reason why you can't um, redo that trade under another refinance opportunity. And then really Travis I think wrapped it up because at the end of the day this is about what customers want and so the customer demand is the thing that's driving it and that's within the traditional community also, a uh, new market participants as well, which has been a big part of country focus. And so, this real converge of all these, of all these moves from uh, the front end, how regulators treat transactions, through to how the organization and customers integrate and operate through their own workflows, the technology that they require to deliver those products. Financial incentives, off trading activity, all being brought together in one kind of end to end continuum that, that really has led to the convergence of all of these activities. Don't get me wrong, this isn't seamless, this isn't completely uh, without bumps and silos at some or many uh, organizations. So, this is a uh, still a, a work in progress, but definitely, definitely. This has been a powerful trend for over two decades. So, uh, are the white right answers to that, of course? Yes. Is there further to go? The answer to that is yes. And I think in each of these areas, there is more work to do. So, that was really um, part one. Uh, remember, since we're actually doing this live, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to pop them in and I'll try to answer them. Uh, we'll be
that hopefully on both platforms. I've never had anyone watching live on YouTube ask me a question, so maybe today will be the day because we don't do YouTube live too often. Okay, I'm now going to take my unsponsored uh, Coca Cola drink break that all of you will have to know, recognize, and love to make certain that the voice lasts. Okay, I'm back, and I still have a voice. So the second one is something that I have been banging on for probably about two and a half years. You know, historically, and I'm guilty of this as well, we have focused on trade execution as critically the most important part of the process of security setting, and I agree with it, but the reality is uh, it doesn't matter how efficient you are, you get the trade in the first place. There's no point being efficient. You need to focus on getting that trade. And so quite rightly, trade execution, capturing that trade, getting it done in the first instance, is the primary focus. You need to get that trade. But look, once you've got that trade, once you've optimized your system and smoothed it out, made it as efficient as possible to execute, hopefully in an automated fashion, the reality is that once the trade is booked, well, the vast majority, you know, 99 percent of the cost in running a trade is not the trade execution. It's the post-trade environment. If the average trade, arguably, equity trade lasts uh, three months, sorry, uh, one month, uh, is worth about a million dollars uh, and is a relatively low fee, that means that there's quite a lot of expense versus a relatively modest income. And the overwhelming majority of the trades would be like that. Uh, the transformation trades are bigger trades because they're, they're typically sovereign bonds, so they're in the 50, 60, 100 million dollar sizes. Uh, and that's great, but also the spreads are very thin. So even those trades, which might be almost perpetual trades, really, uh, even there, the cost of execution and trade maintenance is high. So here, uh, really, the key thing was, uh, I, I think Ed kind of started about by talking about rethinking the infrastructure that you need to execute these trades, and how the pace of change has really been increasing and driving people to uh, re-engineer them. Some of that, I'm sure, is as a result of uh, SFTR, uh, regulations which required more reporting for uh, European regulators. Um, but also uh, CSDR, uh, which is the uh, Central uh, Securities Depositories Regulation, which has actually looked at failed trades. So failed trades now become fine, and because there's fines involved, there's an economic incentive to sort them out beforehand. And so the reality is, it was an okay, acceptable infrastructure uh, a year or two years ago, uh, no longer is today because it's just not. Financially viable. So, so that's very much the, uh, the uh, I guess, the tone of what Ed was talking about that this is really being forced on people. Um, you know, Mike added that uh, really this whole cost reduction process is what's driving the automation requirements. So, not just the financial incentives from doing the trading, but actually having captured the trades, how do you do it at the lowest cost possible? Partly because uh, the reality is that when people get involved, that's where your huge costs come in. Because as soon as you start having people manage individual trades, uh, that's costly. We have over 2 million outstanding transactions in, uh, just in the securities lending markets. Uh, these so every time a person has to handle something, that's pretty expensive. So if you can move to more automation uh, with, uh, with your trade program, Processing trade execution and post trade environment, uh, what you end up with is people doing jobs where only people can make the difference to sort out those transactions. So, not only is it reducing your cost of, of uh, executing and maintaining trades, but it's also making the job more rewarding so that people aren't sitting around uh, booking tickets where effectively you'd have to be uh, almost brain dead to not be able to actually book some of these trades. So, who gets uh, any fun out of doing that kind of 
So um, common good also leading to a better environment for people. Um, uh, Travis was talking about, uh, again, having multiple client needs in and, and different demands from different segments, different clients, different transaction types, but also trying to uh, adapt more effectively by taking best of breed solutions for each of these problems rather than actually just thinking about you know, how you're going to uh, adapt to one of the internal systems uh, to uh, meet those needs. Because we all know that uh, nobody's internal IT systems uh, and departments really respond quickly enough to meet uh, market trends, right? They, they can get there eventually, but they're not designed typically to be a swift foot or agile. Um, Shane was saying, look, the reality is um, that with many of the new market entrants, there are competitive offerings which enable a kind of innovation rather than an entity having to recreate what they're doing. They can take advantage of what's in the market. So let me give you an example. The typical process towards an efficiency that I've seen is you kind of try to improve your internal operational functions first because you've got control over it. You can determine uh, workflows, headcount, uh, investment in technology, acquisition of technology, application of technology. Those are all things that, that each firm controls, but there's a limit. You could be the most efficient counterparty, but if all of, all of your counterparties are inefficient, you're kind of limited. So one of the angles that I think that Shane makes a really good point on is that many of the new service offerings say, well, look, you guys may or may not be as efficient as possible internally, but what we can do is we can kind of bridge the gap and by you know, new service provider bringing innovative technologies to the users, they can continue their internal struggles, but at least on some matching the execution and upstream services, uh, they can take advantage of uh, inherently more efficient structures that can move them forward in the neighborhood to innovate. So really powerful thing, look at the end of the day, this is about trying to get more market participants in, right? Both a, uh, from a new trading activity point of view, so new investors coming from these, always looking for more new supply coming into the market, um, but also new vendors offering other solutions. One of the questions uh, that came in from the audience was, wouldn't it be better if we have just the existing vendors now, and there was some consolidation there, and those fewer vendors could then offer uh, bigger volumes within their services. And look, I, I think while that's a valid point, you know, the reality is, you know, I, I've heard that for many years, why do we need, you know, a clear screen in Europe here? Well, partly you need that for innovation, so that each uh, case is challenging the other. Um, and new vendors uh, will always be in new competition to force the existing incumbents to up their game uh, or risk being yeah, falling by the wayside because of the new, new entrance. So, um, a really valid question because this is a scale game in any way you look at it, but it's the new participants that force the change. And if we can, if we can reduce the cost of the post rate environment, I guarantee you that we will get more uh, investor trading strategies to come in that we haven't experienced before that are just too expensive to execute in today's structure. But if you can knock 25, 50%, 75% off the cost of running a trade, you will see new trades using up more of that supply. Right, so before I move on to the next question, we've got a, a question from Sonia. Sonia, thanks for coming back today. I know you were in the audience yesterday when, uh, uh, when the sound went horribly wrong, uh, so I appreciate you coming back. Uh, can I talk to Baz for SFDR and the implications for entities without credit ratings, uh, including the cost of getting them ready? Uh, what, what Sonia's talking about is that uh, as Baz for continues to try and make Banking regulation and banking market in a, a safer place. A key feature of Basel IV will be that all counterparties that you deal with will be required to have some kind of credit rating 
so that you can uh, assess capital reserves against that appropriately. Um, and of course, not every entity has a credit rating, because credit ratings are for those that need credit. So for institutions like pension funds that typically don't borrow, they don't need a credit rating, so they typically don't have it. Um, look, I did a, a podcast with, uh, with Mark Faulkner from Credit Pension, where we went into this in great detail. Uh, and what I'm, but rather than go into that now, because that's kind of a, a, a bit of a, a left turn from where we are today, what I'll do is I'll put that in the show notes uh, uh, for today's show, and then I'll come back. And look, at the end of the day, there is no question that the whole credit rating environment needs to have a major rethink and an approach, because to the extent that your counterparties don't have credit ratings, when most of four comes into play, uh, it would be too expensive to deal with them. And we're already seeing that today, where um, in the whole automated execution and smart bucketing process, that, that is really part of this lowering the cost of overall trading, where institutions are that want to borrow securities and are directing those trades to the entities that satisfy their priorities. What do I mean by that? First of all, you want to deal on uh, on the stocks that you can borrow anyway, on what we would call the general collateral, the blue chip securities. You want to be the counterparty that has the lowest impact on your capital reserves, like the lowest risk weighted asset cost. And so, if there's three entities there, and one of them is uh, you know is an unrated entity, uh, a, an unregulated hedge fund, say, or regulated that type of thing versus a government versus something in between like the sovereign wealth fund. Um, yeah, that's right. You're going to have priority there. So according to my regulators from almost in the banking regulations, you know, the this entity costs me less from a capital reserve point of view. So I'm going to trade with them. And if you are an entity that's say in the non-netting jurisdiction, so you become very expensive to deal with, uh, you may never get any sort of GC trades. You still get specials, um, but uh, that'll be few and far between. And you get your specials out of any way, so it's not like you're getting extra money. So, but the, the, that kind of a process has been difficult to implement, uh, partly because of the pool cool structure of agents, uh, partly because of uh, technology limitations, partly because uh, although many firms have talked about prioritizing in that way in the past, many of them, many of them have not done it, uh, but increasingly that's been the case. That's also one of the drivers behind uh, pledge, also effective cost, uh, or the, the, effect, the effectiveness and the efficiency in allocating transactions in the most cost-effective manner, right, to counterparties and transactions and legal structures that satisfy Environments. So Sonia, it's a fantastic question. Uh, we'll have to uh, we'll have to revisit it. But again, look look for and listen uh, everyone to the, uh, the Mark Faulkner podcast um, where he goes into this in great detail. Um, now we then moved on to where uh, can you actually get gains, right? Because this whole panel is supposed to be about identifying where we get gains from. Um, you know, Shane talked about uh, you know, the fact that so many firms are stuck with old legacy technology, and that kind of got me into talking about uh, this dilemma that you have when you're, when you're running a business at a bank. You have kind of two competing objectives. One is running this RTP that I've run the bank, and the other is change the bank. So the run the bank means I'm not existing business, it has all my transactions in it. I need to continue to support that business, to make it as efficient as possible, to operate it wherever possible, versus the other thing, which is, yeah, but if my business plan says I own the business and expand the business or take costs out of the business, I need to change the way I'm doing it because I can't just keep doing more and more transactions the way I have because it's cost prohibitive. And you get into a real dilemma sometimes, is where do I spend my money now? I don't spend enough money running the bank, running my existing business, I, that can lead to losses and errors because you have to have to up to date or fines with things like CSDR. 
if, if you're just focusing on um, if you're just focusing on changing the bank, well, that that risks leaving your existing clients and business behind while you're trying to move forward. And so, you always want to make certain running the bank, but also in the future, and that's an ongoing dilemma. I think one of the things that, that Travis pointed out was the whole sort of fintech boom, which has been enabling firms to take a different approach that I referred to earlier, rather than just talking about internal development. So, you know, Travis was talking about responding to customer needs, and rather than try to always come up with a own solution by, uh, you know, by developing things internally, what they have been trying to do is uh, become agile partners, looking for that kind of best fit that I talked about before, and then looking to different service providers to partner with them to deliver new products and new functionality, rather than trying to uh, believe that you know, they can create everything themselves. And, and I think Mike, Mike made the point that the competition between fintech providers and firms is the thing that really drives and facilitates that innovation, right? Because everyone's trying to carve out a niche for themselves, and so just by copying someone else, uh, the best you can be is as good as them, but you can never kind of go past them. So the whole competitive environment that we're in uh, has driven uh, firms to come up with solutions. And, and then we're talking about some of the different uh, automation workflows that actually go into this. And this whole, in this challenge of uh, kind of uh, yeah, old technology and new technology, which, which Shane referred to, you know, Ed was talking about some sort of cloud based solutions and, and different ways of approaching things, which, which vary from the past. You know, I've, I've worked at banks in the past where I thought the world was moving to cloud, but apparently not. That, you know, that my firms knew the best way forward uh, and refused to actually look at things. And I said, well, if we, go, if we solve that problem, we wouldn't have this problem getting back to that run the bank and change the bank. We could upgrade our, our technology and our functionality and capability without actually having to buy new boxes and have new staff and expanding the, the, sort of the support teams uh, and then the backup for the support teams that were required. So, so Ed was talking about sort of a rethink in how, uh, how you approach problems and how you deploy solutions to meet those needs. And, and throwing out that, that competitive point that Mike was talking about, saying, you know, you have this between the legacy interests in, in, in the market, you have all of this cool, possibly clunky infrastructure in place that need to upgrade, uh, whereas we were part of participants have the advantage of taking the best technology that's out there and, and, and deploying them from the get -go. So that's a challenge and it really changed, changed something up and, and again he's one of these, he's from one of these firms that is relatively new entrant into the market and talked about the, the idea to rethink the business and embrace that whole change in workflow. You know, Shane talked us through a great example of why it takes 30 to 35 minutes to execute a manual security selecting training, which is just like that. I mean, when you actually put a cost on executing that trade, that's ridiculous. And as I said, you just you, you can't expect to be competitive and still in this business in the future if you don't rethink uh, the way you do things and embrace that, embrace that kind of change in technology. So gains come from uh, workflows, they come from investment in technology, they come in expanding it out to uh, new market participants, you deliver those gains, uh, which can be revenue increases or cost savings, you can do that uh, by partnering with agile firms, the new, uh, the new market participants with the new services provided by incumbents, and at the end of the day, this is all about the innovation that keeps you hopefully in business. And finally, just as a practical example, we kind of talk through uh, the fact that you know so much of this business is still driven by spreadsheets, telephones, and again going back to Shane's comment in the last one, about 30 to 35 minutes to free a single trade. Um, you know, the, and then Shane Bradley pointed out there was a time when spreadsheets were an upgrade for what we used to do. We used to fax to 
just like three, four man messages uh, back and forth to each other. So uh, I look a little better than they were. Uh, and I do a joke, so I think there is still a reticence for people to innovate because you know you're more likely to get punished for trying to innovate and failing uh, than for not innovating at all. Because when you don't innovate at all, then your business becomes less and less competitive. But it's over time, you lose client business, you lose revenues, and maybe your business gets shut down and you get fired. But it's but it's hard to pick out that moment where you fail to innovate. Whereas you know, taking that step forward and trying uh, trying something that, that fails, you know, you can be penalized for that. And it was interesting because Shane was saying to him, uh, he uh, he said he disagreed with you. And what I, what I was saying is. It's, it, it's not that I'm advocating that people refuse uh, to change. What I'm talking about is an observation of human behavior, which is, in my view, reinforced by regulators uh, because of uh, uh, because the whole change to the bonus culture, which you know has been sold as a great uh, panacea for making banks less risky. What it's really done is made banks more cost intensive. Uh, and uh, less likely to innovate because uh, there is no incentive to innovate to let the same business over the long term, which is hard to measure. So it's to innovating, trying, and failing, and moving on. The change says, look, it's happening in their experience. Their clients uh, are, are trying to actually change the way they're approaching it, different workflows. Uh, he said they see the real experience of, of activity with. Um, uh, life cycle events coming through their platform, optimization of trading, and what they're doing is, is applying algorithms and executing these things. And, and I think that's that's probably true, but I also think that by definition, the entities that are going into the new platform aren't necessarily uh, the whole raft of the traditional market of business. They're almost self selecting by saying the very fact that we're involved means that we are a little bit leading edge. Therefore, more likely to be on the sharp end of innovation anyway. So I'm not surprised that those are the entities that are actually doing it. Look, Travis Scott wanted to get now about the state streets experience, where really the, 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 the mindset has to be one organizationally, where uh, accepting that failure is uh, part of the path of success. Uh, you can't expect to just get it right from the get go, you have to try things. Fail, adapt, and move on. And that's easier said than done. But one of the points that you made is that you need to actually try all of these things out because the pathway is towards digitization. And you can't digitize the historical analog activities and processes that we actually have. You know, they just don't fit. So you're going to have to reinvent the process anyway. Um, and so, uh, you know, those entities that recognize they need to be more digital in the future are having to be. But Mike gave us a good, uh, a good grounding reality, though, and, and, and they're repeating that, you know, change is risky. Uh, but again, kind of going into that digitization process, but even before digitization, Mike saying, well, if you're going to automate something, you have to change because, by definition, if you're going to be automating something, you can't repeat something that wasn't automated in the past. You, Rather than automate the traditional process, you need to rethink that and automate in a better fashion, in a more effective way. Um, so it was, it was particularly strong sort of uh, feedback from that point of view and, and, and a great perspective on that. Like even if you don't want to, uh, you're going to have to do that and you're going to have to find a way to do that risk. And, it, it really, it, it, and, and this has been consistent through the whole thing. All of this is not about whether technology can satisfy uh, what we're looking for. You know, there's technology solutions for literally every problem that we experience. Uh, the real question is, do the market participants involved in those, uh, those businesses, do they have the right mindset to take the technology solutions that are available today and apply them and change the workflows, change structures, uh, change the infrastructure that um, will enable technology to uh, really come to the fore and make those efficiency gains and change the workforce. So, uh, 
that's what we're all trying to do, move away from spreadsheets and telephones. Or the way I actually look at it is, you know, I think tech telephones are actually quite effective. What you need to do <coughs> is actually move away from having to do things that could be automated. Uh, so take those away and automate those. And that means that the people in the world will actually be able to use telephones to uh, do new trades, find new opportunities, uh, find solutions that are not able to be uh, achieved through existing automation, uh, or where there's such complexity uh, that you know, automation is really going to ever be able. So this is about enabling the human capital to be more effective. Uh, and then I asked everyone for their final thoughts on uh, liquidity and trading. Um, I can't remember actually what the sequence was, but um, uh, I think it started uh, with the fact that today's technology, as I just said, um, enables fundamental transformation. You know, if anyone says that this is a technology solution to something that they want to do, I think they probably haven't looked hard enough. Uh, and if they haven't looked hard enough, then you can kind of contact a consultant like me, and I'll help you find a um, solution. But you know, it's, there are solutions for everything. There are more cost-effective solutions for many things, and there's a different way of approaching the business uh, than necessarily legacy providers uh, still deploy today. You can actually change your business Travis was talking about kind of a similar thing in the sense of being open-minded, challenging the status quo, uh, remembering that we're here to actually service customers. They, uh, I haven't mentioned this in the review, but a lot of what uh, Travis was talking about was, was also peer-to-peer -peer activity. So this whole uh, old community, I was going to say new community, but the peer-to-peer -peer group, uh, as part of the business, they're not, they're not new. The whole idea that's new is actually being able to bring them together directly. And so it's really the peer peers are the ones that are actually challenging the status quo as much as, as much as anyone else. And so in order to have a carve out a competitive position yourself, you really need to be able and willing to challenge that status quo and, and come up with better solutions. Um, my guided that really is, it is no longer a trade execution and then post trade and, and maintenance. The reality is, what you need to do is review that entire end to end process from pre trade through to post trade execution, but then also the ongoing optimization that you need to apply throughout that life cycle. And that's how you improve the trading functionality, reduce the cost, and enhance the liquidity in the market. And then finally, you know, Shane, uh, Shane wrapped it up really profoundly, um, you know, that these are changing times, that optimization is what keeps people in the business and keeps them competitive, and, and he invited everyone to join uh, what he called the revolution, and then he thought it and said maybe it's just an evolution of what we're doing. Uh, but I think the consistent thoughts from everyone was about solutions are available. Might have to apply those in a different way. Don't be stuck in your historical thinking uh, because you've been left behind. So, uh, but that's it. Um, that was 45 minutes, so that's almost as long as the session itself. Again, look for the show notes where I'm going to put links in to the, uh, to the event itself. Hopefully, you can still register and then um, access the videos. If not, you know, hopefully. This was uh, uh, of interest to you. Um, and next week I will cover at least a couple, if not all, of the sessions uh, on the next Saturday. Um, I hope that was good for you. Um, that's it for me. It's now Sunday afternoon. I am going to shut this down, get the notes in, into, the, uh, into the show, and uh, then I'm going to take the rest of the day off. I hope you do too. Uh, have a great day, have a great rest of the weekend, uh, enjoy the week, and I'll catch you next week. Thanks.